Barbara Simons, who's the president of Verified Voting. And I'll let everybody get seated really quick. Um, and, I'll, and I'll let you guys do just a couple minutes each on uh, who you are and your organization and so on. Um, and then Dave Forsey with uh, the National Governors Association. Um, and uh, Eric with uh, the Center for Net Security, which is the group that runs the MSISAC, as well as the 20 critical cybersecurity controls. So with that, I'll actually turn it over to you guys to be able to um, talk a little bit about your organization and, uh, and yourself. Okay. All right. Uh, so hi, everybody. I'm Eric Camerling. I'll start out, I guess. Uh, I'm from the Center for Internet Security and uh, CIS. I'm going to refer to it as CIS. CIS produces a number of free things for the, the larger cybersecurity community, among them being uh, the top 20 security controls, which are a set of technical controls that uh, any organization can use for free to enhance the um, cybersecurity stance of their organization, be it private, educational, government, you name it, everyone's free to use them. Um, and so that's one half of CIS, secure benchmarks, uh, top 20 controls, uh, a community that we run for the benefit of everybody. And the other half of CIS is the MSISAC, which is a DHS-funded program, MSISAC standing for Multi-State Information Sharing and Analysis Center. And the MSISAC has built a relationship with all of the 56 uh, states and territories throughout the U.S., um, and we run a network called ALBERT, and ALBERT is uh, uh, closely related to the federal network called Einstein, which is used to monitor uh, .gov space. ALBERT monitors state, local, tribal, and territorial space, and we have sensors throughout the United States in almost every single state and territory in the U.S. Um, so you can think of us, one half of CIS, as an intrusion detection system that covers the entire continental U.S., uh, so that's my intro to what I do, and over to you. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, I help lead cyber, our cybersecurity work at the National Governors Association. For those who don't know, the National Governors Association is a special snowflake. Uh, half of it was actually created by statute. So it's not a 501c3. It's not a corporation. It is a statutory entity. It's called the instrumentality of the states. So every state that's a member, which is virtually every state and territory, uh, pays in dues, and it pays for certain services for governor's offices. I work at the other arm, which is called the Center for Best, Best Practices, which is a 501c3. Um, so we get money from foundations, uh, corporate donors, uh, and federal grants to help states with policy problems. Specifically, I help states with cybersecurity strategy, cybersecurity governance, and cybersecurity uh, disruption response. We like to say that, as everyone in this room knows, we have in many ways figured out the technical methods needed to stop cyber attacks. A lot of the state CIOs and CISOs who run the state systems know this. The hard part is actually getting people to do it, and that's where governance comes in. Uh, we have become much more involved in the election issue, uh, and I'm here to talk more about that, but I'll let you ask questions, and I'll leave it to Barbara. Uh, I'm Barbara Simons. I'm president of Verified Voting. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by training, and I got into the whole voting issue uh, around 2003, and uh, because several of us computer scientists were kind of appalled that uh, Silicon Valley was about to buy paperless voting machines. And despite our best efforts, they went ahead and bought them. But uh, we got sucked into this, and um, uh, like many of my colleagues who I've observed over the years, the more they get, the more they learn, the more they get, have to get involved because they just can't believe what's going on. And I hope that will happen to all of you here if it hasn't already, uh, because we need all the help we can get. Uh, I'm very concerned, and I know many, many of you are too, about what will happen to our democracy if we don't fix our badly broken voting systems. That's what Verified Voting has worked on for years. We've worked on making voting secure. We've focused on the t technology. We're basically mainly a bunch of geeks. We have some attorneys and election officials also who are involved on our board and advisory board. But our main focus has been on uh, making voting technology more secure. We know how to do it. We know it needs to be done. We just have to get it done. All right. Thank you, uh, everybody. So I guess my first question, um, I'll go to Eric. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about the 20 criti critical cybersecurity controls and um, I know several of the, the speakers today have talked about the need for um, state and locals to implement basic cyber hygiene. Uh, I think that uh, on their networks and their databases, 
most people um, in this space would consider basic cyber hygiene to be at least doing the top five critical cybersecurity controls. Do you mind just kind of telling folks what, what those are? Yep. You have to do all of them and even that's not enough. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so, well, let's start by talking about what cyber hygiene is, right? Hygiene meaning trying to raise the bar for some sort of a, a system or a system of systems to a level where uh, you know it's generally resistant or at least more resistant to epidemiological type threats. I, that's the way I think of hygiene, cyber hygiene. Um, and so what are the top five? I mentioned the top 20 security controls that CIS produces, but what are the top five? Um, we often tout the top five as the easiest way for any organization to get to that sort of hygienic stance, right, where you know that you're taking care of the low-hanging fruit. So the top five uh, CIS controls are um, asset um, inventory of, over what is uh, known or authorized or unauthorized hardware in your environment, uh, asset inventory over what is known or authorized or unauthorized software in your environment, secure configuration of that software and that hardware, um, continual and cyclical vulnerability assessment of that hardware and software, of said hardware and software, and lastly, um, uh, figuring out the, who, who should have administrative control and what does administrative control mean in your environment over that hardware and software. So those five topics, if everybody, let's, let's use it, since we're talking about elections, those five topics, if all election networks or if all election systems were to implement those top five pieces of guidance, then the overall hygienic stance of the election system would be enhanced uh, thusly, right? So that's, that's cyber hygiene, or that's the top five for you. Um, so I guess, and uh, uh, Barbara, I'll put this to you. Um, you know, as, as I think we know, you know, most state and local governments, for, for various reasons, um, some, many of which are out of their control, um, aren't able today, at least, to, to implement those top five controls. Um, but a lot of those controls are uh, the actual sensors and so on on the network that can tell you uh, when the bad guys got in, what did the bad guys do, and so on. And so what I think we've seen reported to Congress and in the media by a lot of folks is, like, is this term of, oh, we haven't seen any evidence that votes were tampered with or that the voting registration databases had deletions or changes or so on. But I guess the question is, if they're not put doing even these basic five controls and the sensors aren't there to really understand what's going on, isn't the more, isn't the more accurate answer, well, we really don't know what happened in the election and have no way of telling what happened until those sensors and so on are in place. So, Barbara, did, I know you guys have some thoughts. Well, actually, I have a couple of different thoughts. And by the way, anybody else who wants to jump in? Yeah. Uh, first of all, obviously, these top five uh, requirements need to be in place. But frankly, they're not adequate. I mean, they certainly will not protect against a nation state attack. In fact, the top 20 won't. It's, it's, it's much more serious than that. I mean, the fact that we are here talking about trying to get the top five in place, I think, is a very sorry reflection on the state of the security of our voting systems in this country. Um, I mean, I don't mean to take away from what you're doing. It's very important. I don't disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we need much more. We need, we need a sense of urgency. We need sort of like, um, uh, what was it, the Chicago project? Well, the bomb, what was the project for building the bomb? Was it Chicago? Uh, Manhattan, yes. But it was at Chicago, but it was called the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Right. We need a Manhattan Project for our voting systems. That's really what we need. Uh, now, in terms of the 2016 election, uh, we do know that, that at least one voter registration database, one, one vendor for voter registration databases was hacked. And we know, for example, that that vendor was what was used in, in Durham, North Carolina, where there were major problems on election day. As far as I know, nobody has gone back to do a, an analysis of the voter registration database in Durham, North Carolina, to see if there were a lot of changes made uh, to people's names or addresses or various information that would send them off to the wrong place to vote and create chaos. So we don't know even in that case where we know that the vendor had been hacked. Uh, in the case of uh, throughout the country on the voting machines, um, even where there are paper ballots, in most cases, we did not do an adequate check to see if any hacking had occurred there. And of course, where there, are, where there is no paper, it's almost impossible to check. I mean, we could try impounding the machines and doing a forensic analysis, but it's very hard, as I'm sure you guys know, it's very hard to do a forensic analysis of a computer. And even if you do it, 
and don't find something doesn't mean something wasn't there. So the bottom line is we do not know if the 2016 election, the votes themselves were hacked or not. We don't know if the voter registration database bases were hacked or not. Um, and it's unacceptable to be in that state of ignorance. We need to make our elections such that we know that the correct candidates, the candidates who were declared the winners were in fact the winners. We do know how to do that, but we're not doing it now. So did you want to defend? Think, yeah. um, although you were right to hand it to Dave because my next question is for him. But uh, so, uh, you know, some of this is kind of really technical, like the stuff CIS does. I think um, some of the um, auditing and so on that Verified Voting talks about is obviously really important. But, um, you know, oftentimes we hear about what secretaries of state want or uh, county clerks, um, you know, suggesting to do this, that, or the other thing. Uh, but it seems to me that governors are actually really important to this conversation, and um, I'd really love to hear how uh, NGA or, or you, Dave, specifically, are thinking um, about this in terms of the role of governors and, and so on. Okay, so a few caveats. Uh, nothing I say here today is in any way uh, articulating an official position of the National Governors Association or any governor's office. Okay, period. That being said, my team at NGA, uh, we're not, we don't have technical backgrounds, right? We're engineers at heart, but we do not have degrees in computer science. We're lawyers. We think this is a huge problem. Uh, we know that governors have a role because while under many state constitutions, the Secretary of State is a constitutionally separate branch from the governor, the fact is that a lot of the deployable assets and a lot of the expertise relevant to cybersecurity resides in state agencies that are under the purview of the governor. In many cases, a lot of the back-end systems that are used to run elections, like voting registration databases, are actually part of the services that the CIO's office manages. So there's no question that when it comes to actually preventing attacks and responding to attacks, that governors have a role. I'd also point out that if you want to make any changes to election law, not necessarily policy, but law, you'll need to sign legislation. And governors are the ones that sign legislation, and if you want them to sign it, they need to have buy-in. I'd also say that the bully pulpit that governors have is incredibly valuable in terms of raising the profile of this issue at the county level, state level, and federal level. If you want a HAVA, HAVA 2.0, you're going to need governors on your side. So that's why we definitely deserve to be in the conversation. Um, so in the same vein, I'm wondering from the MSI SAC's perspective, if you're seeing uh, governors or uh, other state executives um, bringing their CIO or CISO into the conversation on how to better uh, secure our voting systems, uh, both from the back-end database and, and network um, perspective, as well as kind of the front-end stuff that Verified Voting talks about, which is the machines themselves and the ballots. So, Eric, what um, is MSI SAC seeing on a CIO and CISO participation in this? So, so that's, that's actually an interesting question um, for myself and for my organization, because the MSI SAC interacts daily, I would have to say daily, with CISOs from all of the states in the U.S., right? So um, what are we seeing? Well, we've been seeing since the advent of, of uh, basically the news cycle with election hacking, um, an uptick in communication from CISOs from state cybersecurity departments and so forth. We're seeing a lot of activity uh, coming from the DHS side at us, right, regarding setting up committees and so forth and councils and meetings. A lot of activity coming, up, coming at us from the um, National Association of uh, um, Secretaries of State, Right? So we're interacting with an election officials left and right. MSISAC really plays a middleman role in a lot of this in terms of we're watching the wire, right? We're watching what's happening over the Internet that's bound for the states. And so when stuff like this happens with uh, election cyber hacking, um, our, our communication, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but our communication volume basically skyrocketed, right, regarding this. Um, we have been facilitating some meetings. Um, I can't necessarily tell you between who, but we've been facilitating meetings. We're seeing a big uptick. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Um, so then on, on top of that, I guess my question, um, back to Barbara. Uh, so, you know, if, if governors are, you know, showing interest in this, then obviously and, and the uh, CIO and CISO in the state are, um, are you guys getting more more traffic from uh, clerks and secretaries of state asking you guys, you know, about best practices and so on. Um, and if so, uh, you know, w what are you hearing? Are you hearing good questions? Are you hearing, um, 
uh, very technical questions or, or people trying to figure out the right answers to this stuff or, or what um, is the nature of the conversations? Well, I, I, I don't know about traffic to our website and I don't know if we keep tabs on that or not. I mean, one of the things that we have on our website is a map of the United States which shows what types of machines are used in every state and break, breaking it down to every county. And we're really the only resource that, that provides that. So incidentally, if you want to know what's going on around where you live, just check verified voting, click on the verifier, and you can get that information. As far as technical questions coming from uh, election officials and so on, um, individuals involved with verified voting might be getting those questions, but typically we don't get questions sent to the organization itself. So. Okay, good. So I wanted to, so that's the end of my questions, but I wanted to get to questions from folks in the audience uh, for the group here. So, uh, sure. Yes. And if you can just yell. Um. I will. So I think it's first of all important to know that, oh, so I believe your question is, uh, what I'm saying makes it sound like we're speaking out of both sides of our mouth. Um, and that you're saying that in, in the past, secretaries of state and governors, this is not a statement for me, I'm repeating the question, have said that everything's fine. Um, I think it's first of all important to remember that uh, awareness of cybersecurity as a problem is relatively new at the higher rungs of government in many cases. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that the National Governors Association rarely makes a policy statement as a uh, single voice of the governors. So I don't speak for governor's offices. I can't speak for them. I do know that the many of the cabinet officials who are in, who run state agencies, think this is a huge problem. And they want resources to deal with it. That is what I can tell you. And it is up to us to going forward. You know, I came here to DEF CON to see for myself just how vulnerable the systems are. And it's clear that they're vulnerable. So it is now up to the Center for Best Practices to do our best job to educate everybody at the state level that this is a serious problem. And then identifying key practical recommendations that we can implement before 2018 and 2020. That's my job. But I, I cannot speak to what governor's offices say. Here, you're close enough. I'll just give you the mic. Um, an ancillary question to that. As I was covering this past election, I, I experienced, I felt the closer we got to the election, the more frequent the response I got from people I was asking about the security of the election was, we can't question it because if we do, people won't vote. And I'm concerned as we come to next November and in 2018, it feels like the, you know, when we get into those final couple of months, everybody clams up because there's this fear that will somehow the electorate will stay home if they don't trust it. I mean, do you think that's going to happen? How can we get past that? Um, so I'll actually take a crack at the first um, part of that answer, if, if that's okay. Um, so in a previous life, um, I did political campaigns for a living, and in fact, I was. Uh, uh, President Obama's uh, National Deputy Field Director in 2008, and um, we spent an enormous amount of time researching uh, why people turn out to vote, why people don't turn out to vote, um, what makes people uh, stay home, and, and so on. And we never, ever once saw any research that indicated that, you know, lack of cybersecurity or something like that uh, would make people stay home to vote, ever. In no research, not, not once. Um, and I will say, though, that it is often Democrats, um, the party that I'm a part of, who make these asinine claims that, oh, if you say that there's a security issue, um, people will stay home to vote. I will say, 
a group of people that I'm not a, uh, um, a group of, which is attorneys, are usually the people making that claim on the Democratic side. It's our voter protection attorneys who make these um, ridiculous points, and, uh, and there's just no evidence to back it up. Um, but I'm happy to let somebody else I jump I in. Uh, I, I've, I've also heard that claim, and my, my response is uh, we should be truthful with people, and we should fix the problem. And if we fix the problem, then we can say truthfully that, that you can vote because your vote will be counted correctly. What we need are paper ballots and mandatory post-election manual ballot audits. If we put those two things in place throughout the country, our, there's no way to hack our elections because you can't hack paper. Um, it's a great question. Uh, three points, and I wrote them down to make sure I get them right. Uh, so the story is, the narrative is already out there, so I don't know how pretending, I mean, it, that's done. Cat's out of the bag. A lot of voters are reading news stories on this every day, so we might as well talk about it reasonably and rationally. There's no reason to bury our heads in the sand. Um, the, the concern that, the, the, I know that there's a lack of data on that, but I think it's a legitimate concern that people won't vote because of this. Um, I think that is all the more reason to plan ahead now. A lot of the, um, in, right before 2016, there were so many questions that were raised and not enough answers. And I think the best thing that states can do is to plan ahead, have a publicly released plan that shows this is how we are going to deal with any problems that arise. And then you're not forced to make up answers that you might not have questions to right before an election, right? Um, but I do think that's a good question, but I, I don't see why we would pretend like people are not already listening to the message, right? Um, that's my answer to that. Do you want to say? No. Did that answer your question? I don't know, does anybody have a... Yeah. You can go first. Verified voting has done that sort of thing in the past uh, at the state level. For example, um, well, one of the things we've been very involved with is fighting internet voting at the state level. Maybe that's a negative, but we've also worked on model language for, for, for uh, voting. Um, but indeed, you're right, we do need model language. Uh, but sometimes, one of the things that sometimes happens is that there's, there's a piece of legislation that comes along and you think you can stick something in it that'll help your cause. I'm sure you, that happens with the environmental movement too. So that's something else that, that we do. Like hopefully there'll be some cybersecurity legislation coming along and we can say give some money for voting machines because that's a cybersecurity threat, hopefully. Is that a resource Model language, no, we should have it there. <laughs> that's a very good, good suggestion. We should have model language on our website for legislation. I'm sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was is there model language? Um, uh, as I work at a 501c3, we have to be very careful with lobbying. So my particular body doesn't write model legislation. However, we certainly give policy recommendations on a regular basis. There are two things you can check out. You can go to Meet the Threat. Uh, you can just Google Meet the Threat. Uh, states confront the cyber challenge, which was uh, Governor Terry McAuliffe's uh, cybersecurity initiative that just ended recently, but we're not going anywhere. And then we recently released a Gov's Guide, a Governor's Guide to Cybersecurity, which is also available online, should be accessible through Google by now. And um, we have a whole one-pager on election security that includes recommendations that someone might decide to include legislation. But we don't have model legislation, no. Great. Actually, probably. OK, great. That's the first time I've heard. That's a very interesting question. I have not thought of that. I'm sure somebody has, but it's a very good point, and I'm writing it down because I'm going to go make sure that we think more about it. All right. Oh yeah. Can you repeat the question? Oh, the question. I think so. Your question was: Have we, in the context of this discussion, have we considered about the census? And are, are you saying that? Are you saying that the census could be the integrity of the census could be corrupted?
I have heard nor read no one talk about that, so I don't know, but I certainly want to look into it. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, go ahead. In the plan. Um, I'm not answering that question. Uh, um, it's up to states whether they want to. Uh, so the, the question is, does the National Governors Association believe that states who have not come forward publicly after um, being breached, whatever breach even means, let's recall that often people misuse the term, sometimes they're just talking about a port scan, and that's not necessarily a breach. Should they come forward? Um, I'm not aware of any... Uh, law that requires them to do so, and National Governors Association would never ask states to do something they don't want to do, so that's up to each particular governor. Uh, not about disclosure. States talk about election security with each other and state officials all the time, but uh, not about this particular issue, and I wouldn't know that. So I, I can actually speak to that a little bit as well from the MSI SEC standpoint. Since I said uh, MSI SEC acts as a uh, almost like a cybersecurity proxy in many ways, right? Where we facilitate communication among states and so forth. And and so you mentioned a figure that the DHS had let out. I can tell you this from the MSI SEC standpoint, and also from the state standpoint, um, we take the the privacy regulations and so forth of each state very very seriously. In fact, our entire constituency and everybody who's do, who's um, collaborating with us, it's done on trust. And so we couldn't, uh, the MSI SEC could never release that type of information uh, because each state trusts us as an organization to not do that, right? Um, but so I don't know if that helps lend, uh, lend some information to your question or not, but um, at least from the MSI SEC standpoint and from the standpoint of how the states collaborate with, either, with each other from a cybersecurity standpoint, I wouldn't keep your fingers crossed in terms of that kind of stuff coming out. Not sure if that helps, but... Yeah, and so the last thing I can say about that is that that avenue that you just outlined where the, the people are writing letters to their, let's say, um, you know, um, secretaries of state or something requesting public information, that would be, I think, the suggested um, path that MSISEC would say the re regular everyday citizens should take because an organization like ours couldn't disclose that information. Just by the nature of what we do, we can't disclose that publicly. So, Nor could I was, real quickly, uh, Texas did just, just pass a law that uh, is going to require the Secretary of State to do a post-mortem on the 2016 election. So you might want to look into that. Who's next? Go ahead. Um, I'm, so I don't think that there's anything right now. Um, I think that there's a lot of folks who've been talking about this, about how do we compel states to, to disclose this. Um, and and I, I think there's going to be a lot more conversation about it uh, in the future. Um, so I'm almost positive that there is legislation that has been introduced for a federal data breach notification law. Um, almost positive. Uh, don't quote me on that. But so if that's movement, I don't think there's any chance it's going to pass. But 
if that answers your question. Um, okay, so we have one minute. So I did want to just give um, some final wrap-up notes on what's been going on in the in the village uh, since today. So for anybody who wasn't in the room when I announced it earlier, um, within an hour and 40 minutes, uh, the the group in there were able to remotely um, gain access to a win vote machine, um, and with and another group with no prior knowledge of the device at all was able to hack um, an express poll book. Uh, and get in and start messing around with the with the uh, database in there that would that would contain a list of voters. Since then, since I made that announcement around noon today, um, they've gained access to, access to hardware and firmware of a TSX machine, um, and they're currently in the process of reverse engineering the infrared communication protocol of an Ivotronic. Um, and so they've moved a bunch of the so our uh, our friends in the voting village are. Um, have become a little bit manic about this whole thing, and so they've moved the machines upstairs so that they can start working on them uh, tonight, actually. I think there'll be peop some people with a, a lot of um, uh, jolt cola and uh, no sleep um, messing around with voting machines tonight, so we're excited about that. Uh, I don't know, it just says upstairs. <laughs> Probably didn't tell me on purpose. Um, okay, so with that, thank you everybody who came to um, this today and um, we look forward to seeing folks tomorrow.